Um, let's get started. Uh, let me get the signing sheet passed around. So, uh, in terms of announcements, it's probably a good idea to bring your laptops on Friday uh, if you've got one. Um, and you definitely probably want to sit with your groups. Um, we're going to start, I'm going to start running through some calculations with you. And I'm, and I'm focusing uh, in this and in um, uh, some of our design examples on steel because what you're going to find when you start getting into your uh, selection of alternatives, I mean, you have a brick, so there's multiple different alternative designs that you can produce. But what you're going to find is that unless you're doing a custom uh, designed reinforced concrete solution like we did last semester, like a T-beam bridge or something like that, you're going to find that a lot of your concrete solutions are already pre-sized. I mean, you go to the West Virginia DOH standards and the, the beams are already sized. So there's no, you know, si there's no like determining flange thicknesses or web depths or, or anything like that because it's all already done. Um, the only thing that you're going to do in those instances is determine reinforcement patterns. And I, I really doubt that's going to change, you know, massively the alternative portion of your projects. Uh, that I'm not really too concerned about. What I am concerned about is your ability to appropriately size the steel shape, because that is going to be uh, unique. So that's what we're going to talk about today. What I'm going to show you all is uh, some methods to preliminarily, if that's a word, uh, in a preliminary fashion, size your eye, your eye girders. Now, the idea is what we'll do today is develop a methodology to get a rough size for an eye shape. You will then take that size and do calculations with it. But you need some starting dimensions. So hopefully today, um, what we do today will help out with that. Um, let me pull up my, uh, my PowerPoint on sizing and we can get into this um, to give you all kind of an idea. Okay. So what I'm going to be presenting to you all are some rules of thumb. These are some um, sort of guesstimation techniques that you can use to get a rough size of your I-shaped girder for the purposes uh, of your bridge. Um, if you've got, um, I mean, th think about it like this. If you've got an I-beam and you've got three different elements, a top flange, a web, and a bottom flange, they could all have different thicknesses, different widths, uh, and all of that. Um, the, there's also different stages of loading. You know, the non-composite section is going to see different loads than the composite section. There's a lot of variables. You know, how far apart do you space the beams? Uh, how far apart do you space your crushing? There's a lot of variables. So just picking a, a just picking a beam size is actually going to be a little tough um, unless you've got somewhere to start. And there's a couple ways that you can go about that. You can use historical data from your firm. Company designs bridges all day, every day. It's definitely going to be the best place to start. But in here, we're going to use some fundamental rules of thumb. Um, uh, some data that you might have at your company might look something like this. So this is um, this is just an example of, of what I mean by this type of company. But this would be an example of a span uh, to weight ratio for a given uh, bridge girder. So if you have a singly supported bridge uh, or simply supported bridge, a single span, and looking at your various, uh, any girder spacing, uh, base, you know, any girder spacing, any range of it, based on a given span, you can get a general idea of the steel weight of your bridge, and that can give you a, a, good, a good starting value. Uh, what I'm going to do with you all is use some rules of thumb. These let me be clear, these equations are not things that, that can be derived. This mostly I got most of these from a presentation made by an engineer at Hirschfeld Industries. Hirschfeld is a really, really big uh, and prominent steel plate girder fabricator. They're the ones who are doing all the, the cutting and the welding for steel plate girders. And I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to walk you through how we can size a girder and then give you some general just tips and points as you all develop your, your own cross sections and your own sizes. So um, I want to walk you through some of the uh, uh, some of the equations. Some of the stuff again it can come from the spec. Uh, some of it it can come from from experience. So I want to start off with the girder depth. 
the girder depth D. So how, the, the girder depth, I'm basically saying how deep the web is. So you can go about this a couple ways. You can use traditional minimum depths. There's actually a table in the specification that will tell you, based on your span length, how deep a given, uh, a given element is. Oh, whoops. So for instance, if I'm talking about a steel superstructure, the depth of the I-beam should be the span length times 0.033. If we're talking about the overall depth of the composite beam, it should be 0.04. So that can, or 0.04 times the length. So that can give you an idea of about how deep the beam ought to be, how deep the entire bridge ought to be. Uh, very similar uh, for T-beams and reinforced concrete, for pre-stressed concrete elements, for your precast I-beams, adjacent box beams. You know, you can look at this and you can see traditionally how deep your, um, uh, your bridge element ought to be. This is in no way, shape, or form telling you, oh, that is your final answer. These are just traditional minimum depths. Yes, sir. That's a good question. Um, so the question was, uh, what is L if you've got multiple spans, essentially, is what we're saying. Um, it, and that's a good question. There, there are instances where when we and the term L gets thrown out, what do we mean by L? Um, and usually it's a function of context. What I will say is this. Um, if we're talking about um, a situation like this, um, L is usually referring to something like the average span length. So if you have, a, let's say, a two-span bridge, we're talking about the average of each of those individual spans, not the entire length. Okay. Now, if you have a two-span bridge where one span's only 50 foot long and the other's 100 foot long, then you're probably talking about an L value of something like 75. Does that make sense? When we compute distribution factors, and you all really shouldn't have to worry about this too much, but when you compute distribution factors, uh, you're going to compute distribution factors for regions in positive bending, regions in negative bending. For positive bending, it's basically just the span length within the span that you're considering. And for negative bending, it's the average of the two adjacent spans. Because negative bending, we're talking about the pier. Does that make sense? No, no, no. It would, it would, oh, in that case, we're talking about from support. The splice uh, doesn't really matter. I mean, one point I will mention, you're designing your splice for, for lack of a better term, designing it to be stronger than the beam. The beam's the weak part, not the splice. You see what I mean? So don't think of the splice as like some hinge in the middle of, of the beam. We're not going to be employing that, and we don't employ that really anymore anyways. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? That's a good, that's a good question, though. So in that case, the whole thing is the whole, yeah. Uh, yeah, unless you put a pier in the middle. A continuous span is, is um, where you have something like this. So here, let me see if my pen will work. This is what I mean by a continuous span. You know, you, oh goodness. Hold on, let me try something. Enable editing. Now let's try. There we go. So let's say you have you know, a bridge like this, and you put, you know, a pier right there. This, this, would, this would be continu a continuous span because the, the beam is, in fact, continuous over that pier. Now, now, let me also add this. It is possible to have a situation like this. You know, for instance, if you've got uh, you know, precast concrete elements, this would not be a continuous bridge. This would not be a two-span bridge or a, con uh, uh, a continuous bridge. Think about it like this. Is this statically indeterminate? No, right? These are just two simply supported beams that are right next to one another. So instead of a 120-foot long bridge here, it's two 60-foot bridges. Does that make sense? So that's what I mean by continuous span. One of the advantages of, of a continuous span bridge is that the beams and the bridge itself tend to be a little shallower. The reason why is because in a continuous span bridge, your moments tend to go down. Okay, So 
Um, if you were to use a continuous span bridge, it would be indeterminate, but you'll notice you'll have ultimately a thinner, uh, a shallower superstructure. Yes? Sir. Um, yeah, it's possible, but, but, um, hold on, let, let me qualify my answer a little bit. Um, you need to consider maximum shipping, uh, typical maximum shipping widths and maximum shipping lengths. That's how I will answer that question officially, okay? Um, I don't want to say any more than that. You can find that, I mean, that, that, you can find that out. One thing I, I will qualify my answer by saying this, don't worry about shipping something and it's so heavy that the adjacent roads can't handle it. Like whatever, you know, if you had a beam that was 200, you know, 200 tons, some massive, you know, element, assume you can, you can get that there from a weight standpoint. I'm not going to worry about that. Um, but I'm just going to make you adhere to typical maximum shipping dimensions. Okay. So like, like here's a for instance. Typically, the maximum width of a shipping of an element that you can ship is seven and a half feet. So if you've got some element that you're shipping that's wider than seven and a half feet on the flatbed, you would need special permitting. I'm going to try. I'm try to make y'all avoid that. So. But that shouldn't be a big deal. But I'm going to make you do some digging on that. A little bit. Everybody okay with this so far? Everybody okay with this? All right. Um, let's let's talk about uh, design a little bit. So um, uh, traditionally, when you are designing a, uh, a composite steel bridge, and this is true with concrete bridges as well, when you've got beam elements, um, when you use really really shallow beams or really really deep beams, like on either end of the spectrum, the bridge weight tends to go up. Like, if, if you've got a bridge that you're designing and you've got really strict clearance requirements or really, really strict height requirements, the only way to make the bridge shallower, to make the beams shallower, is to space them closer together and throw more of them in. Okay? You, you see what I mean? So there's, that's physics. There's really no other, other way around that. I don't care if it's a steel bridge or a concrete bridge, but that doesn't change. Okay? But there is a sweet spot. Okay? Um, for steel bridges, it's somewhere between 25 and 30, so uh, we'll just say 27.5. So if you have a bridge and it's 50 foot long, you can determine about what the depth of that girder should be. You, you see what I mean? So that is an expression that you can use to get yourself started. Okay? Now let's talk about what the will tell you about how deep your girder should be. That's the depth of that web. But about, what about how thick that web is? Okay. Well, for a web that does not contain longitudinal stiffeners, and, and what I mean by that is um, if you look at a really, really long uh, steel beam bridge, like a really long one, like plate girder bridge, what you'll see is you'll have, you know, a beam that goes, you know, goes like that. And you might find in the compression region an additional plate that sort of runs like that. You might have seen those before. Those are called longitudinal stiffeners. A transverse stiffener would be one that sort of, you know, goes like that, you know, stiffens the web. We try and avoid longitudinal stiffeners whenever possible. And I can guarantee you, if you need longitudinal stiffeners on your bridge for your project, you did something wrong. We're talking about, like, Huge bridges. Um, for, bri or for webs that do not contain longitudinal stiffeners, the slenderness, remember in steel slenderness, the ratio of the width to thickness of a given plate? If you do not have longitudinal stiffeners, then you have to keep this ratio less than or equal to 150. Okay, so that's a requirement. You have to keep it less than or equal to 150. But for design purposes, I mean, 
let's back that up a little bit and use 120. I mean, economically, it makes sense to use somewhat of a non-compact web, but it can't be too slender. So for design purposes, we'll back that up and use 120. So if equation one will tell you how deep the web needs to be, equation two will tell you how thick it needs to be. Okay? And again, let's be clear. I, I cannot emphasize this enough. These are rules of thumb. This will get you to starting size. You're going to take this starting size, throw it into an Excel sheet, and start doing some counts. I guarantee you it probably won't work completely. Like there'll be one performance ratio that fails, or maybe it, it passes too well. You're going to need to tweak these. Okay? This will give you a starting seed value. Okay? Make sense? That's shear. That's a shear. The simple answer is this. The um, analogy, there's a very close analogy to designing stiffeners for steel beams and stirrups for reinforced concrete beams. Okay? If you look at stiffeners in highway bridges, the ones that aren't connected to cross frames, you will find that they are near the abutments or near the piers. And the reason why is look at your shear diagram. Your, shear di your shears around the abutments and the piers go through the roof. Okay? And the main body of the span you probably won't see other than where they're connecting cross frames. That's a good question. That's a really good question. It's the same, I mean, uh, so what do you mean, are you talking about the actual size of the stiffener? The actual size and the thickness of the stiffener isn't really that difficult. There's some, basically some very fundamental equations, like, you know, you have thickness limits and width limits. You can solve for what the size of the stiffener needs to be relatively easily. That, that's not really the challenge. The challenge is where to put them. Um, and what you want to try and do, uh, I mean, honestly, you want to try and use as few longitudinal stiffeners as possible. Um, like if you go back to uh, old plate gutter bridges that were built back in the you know, 50s and 60s and stuff like that, you'll see them all over the place. I mean, they're, they're like every, D along, every depth along the girder. More modern bridges, you might see one or two of them, and that's it. Nowadays, we would elect to use, I mean, let's be clear, the stiffeners are meant to increase the shear strength of a girder. Okay. Now, it might have been a while from steel design, and I know we covered it at the very end, but the shear in a girder is carried primarily by the web. The flanges are what primarily carry the moment, right? Nowadays, it, you know, if, if I had a decision, do I use eight stiffeners and a thin web or two stiffeners and a little bit of a thicker web? I'm going to go with a thicker web because that's less cutting and less welding, okay? Does that make sense? Your bridge, if, if, I, if you're using more than two stiffeners, like having to place two stiffeners all, along the link, you're probably doing something wrong. Okay? I'm not saying it's, it, you know, that, it's, um, uh, that you won't need them. I'm just saying it's probably going to be more economical to use less of them than more of them. It would, I mean, if you all produced a design that didn't need any, I actually wouldn't be that surprised. Because again, the function of the shear strength of the web. So, so you, you would compute a VVN of the web and the VU, the factored load. And if the VVN is smaller and it can't carry the load on itself, you'd start putting stiffeners in it. Sound good? These are good questions. Anybody else, sir? Let's look at the, the flanges. I'm going to start off with the compression flange. So, uh, for, for our purposes, purposes, I'm talking about the flange that's on top. Now, ASHTO requires that the ratio between the width of the flange and the depth of the, uh, of the to six. Okay. Now, one of the things that that you that you might start asking is where the heck do a lot of these limits come from? BF over D less than or equal to six. Like, where the heck does all that stuff come from? Well, it comes from two different philosophies. One of them is it comes from research. You know, folks like, like me will go down to the lab because, again, we think any day with controlled demolition is a good day, and we'll in, try and investigate something like what is the 
steel I-beam. Uh, so we'll go and we'll load a steel I-beam uh, up until failure, up until it buckles, and we'll start recording like its moment rotation response and then ask, well, what's a good response that we would want? And then what proportions does the girder need to meet in order to achieve that response? That's kind of where this BF over B ratio comes from specifically. That's one place it comes from, but, but another place uh, it, or another mode of thinking is really where the specification comes from in general. The specifications are pretty open-ended. I mean, they're, they're, um, they try and, and cover as many parameters as possible, but they also leave the freedom of the design in your hand. In other words, you could size a, an, an eye shape any way you'd want. You could have thick flanges, thin flanges, wide flanges, uh, 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 you know, shallow girder, deep girder, what have you. But one of the philosophies that is, within, that is within the specification is that the girder that you are designing is, in fact, an I-beam. Let me ask you this. Is that an I-beam? You're saying, yeah. Do, is it going to behave like an I-beam? I would argue that that's going to behave much more like a T-shape than an I-beam, okay? Is it a, is it, what's that? <laughs> is, uh, is it um, uh, a two horizontal plates that are parallel welded into a, lo a longer longitudinal plate? Yes. But I would argue it does not meet the cross-section proportion behave like an I-beam. To calculate the capacity of that beam, those equations assume that you're dealing with an I-beam. The girder has to, has to meet those requirements. So when you open up the spec and you see all these proportional, it's like, where the heck is this stuff coming from? This is one of the big reasons. It's trying to ensure that these proportions are met. Does that make sense? So I, I just want you to know like, where this stuff is coming from. We'll talk about it in more detail later, but I wanted you to have sort of a general idea. And same thing is true in, in concrete. I mean, you have proportional limits there as well. They're not as stringent because the concrete element can be a little bigger anyways. But it's something to keep in mind. So when you put proportional in there, it's not as bad. It's more like offset. Like, I don't know why that is. Well, okay. The question doesn't really go along with, with what I'm talking about. I'll, I'll, I'll explain. So I totally agree with you that if you have a composite deck on a, uh, a steel beam, that it's going to behave differently than the steel beam by itself. Okay? What I am also saying is that in a bridge scenario, it's not one or the other, it's both. We have to assess the capacity of the girder in its non-composite state and its composite state. It's very possible the work scenario is during deck casting that the actual performance you know if we remember you remember efficiency from reinforced concrete design when we took the load over the resistance it's very possible that you and we call it performance ratios in bridge engineering it's very possible you have a higher performance ratio when the decks being forward than when it's actually in service okay you have to assess both so you have to assess the girder in its non-composite state and its composite state and to further answer your question, yes, to, when it's a composite, you compute the capacity. So. Yeah. You have to do both. That would be the steel beam by itself. Yes, you will have to do both. But that shouldn't be the mystery because I taught you all how to do that last semester. The mystery is, what if it's composite? And that's actually easier. So. So. Am I good so far? OK. So we've got a depth. We've got a thickness. Um, I propose that a simple um, way of determining the width of the compression flange is to take the depth and divide it by four. We're basically taking that limit of six, backing it off a little bit. OK. Now, that's the, um, that's the, compression, or that's the compression flange width. To determine the compression flange thickness, this is actually one that uh, that we can derive. Um, do you all remember 
limits like this in the specification when we took steel. Remember like BF over 2TF had to be less than or equal to some quantity. Y'all remember that? This is the one that was there for beams. Uh, you can open up the manual. It's right in uh, the, uh, that table of compactness limits. Well, if you've got this and you know E and FY, just solve for your flange thickness and there you go. Since we're dealing with steel, we can plug in, um, like we got 50 KF steel, E's 29,000, bam, there we go. So those are ones we can actually derive. Um, your flange thickness should be about one and a half to two times just to make sure everything's coming out right. Okay. Your tension flange, as a general rule, your tension flange is going to be larger. Going to what Mr. Lewis was saying, in compression, you've got the concrete deck helping you out. So when the bridge is in its finished state, the compression flange doesn't need to be as large because the concrete deck is helping it out. But on the tension flange, there's nothing there but the steel. So tension flanges typically need to be a little bit larger. On the, uh, on the whole, they typically need to be around one and a half times larger. So if you take the flange thickness, multiply it by one and a half, that'll get you the flange thickness for the, uh, the tension flange. If you assume the same width, there's your girder. Let me walk you through a pretty basic example to give you kind of an idea. Let's say we have a girder that's 150 feet long. So if I have a girder that's 150 feet long, that's 150 feet, which is 1,800 inches. Okay. So first off, the girder depth. So if it's 150 foot uh, a good estimate for design depth is that I take that length and I divide it by 27 and a half, do the math and that comes out to about 65 and change. This is design. So 66 inches. I mean, we're talking about a bridge that's 120 feet long and you know, the girder is about five and a half feet deep. So. No, this is just a steel beam by itself. Just the beam. Okay, so we'll, and, and again, this will be tweaked as, as we move on. So we'll have a design depth of about 66 inches. As for the thickness, if I take the thickness uh, or the depth and divide it by 120, I'll get about 0.55. If I round that up to the nearest fractional dimension, um, I could probably get away with something like 9 sixteenths. I'm just going to go ahead and use 5 eighths uh, and see what we get. So the uh, web thickness, we'll take that at 5 eighths. The flange width, I take the depth and divide it by 4, so 66 divided by 4 is 16 and a half. I tend to like my flanges in even dimensions. No real reason behind that, it just tends to be what I end up using. So we'll use uh, 18 inches for that. Um, flange thickness, that's where I derive that, that and I take that 18 divided by 18.3 and it comes out to about 0.984, so round it up to an inch take my uh, flange thickness for the tension flange, bump that up by 50%, and there's my girder, okay? It is a rough estimate. Keep in mind, this is absolutely in no way the final size of that girder, but it gets you started, okay? You can take that, those dimensions, get it started, start computing some properties, start computing some loads, start computing some capacities, and see if that girder size needs to be increased or needs to be decreased. Yes. What do you mean? What, what, what is the equation considered in this question? Those, okay, that's a good question. First, first off, let me be clear. These equations come from experience. These are rules of thumb. There's no science. There's, there's not a lot of science behind this. This comes from folks who've been designing thousands and thousands of bridges, and they go, this is usually what works. Now, these are assuming very typical loading scenarios. So for bridges like this, we're talking about 8-inch concrete decks, typical um, Ashto HL93 uh, live loads typical stuff. Now, let's be clear. If this was a transportation out and the trucks were heavier, well, this wouldn't work, you know. So this is just fundamental loads, basics. What, what do you, uh, Yes, I'm saying I'm saying for a coal road, it'll probably end up bumping up. Right, right. Yeah, 
And let me also say this. I'm literally just talking about the beam in this instance. One thing I haven't talked about is the actual cross section. How far apart the beams are, how far apart the beams are spaced, your overhang. I'm getting ready to mention some of that here in a second, just to, just to sort of clarify some things. Everybody okay with this? Okay. All right. Now, these are a few more key ideas that you all need to keep in mind as you're, um, as you're uh, uh, beginning your design. Let's talk about girder spacing. In general, wider girder spacing is better, okay? Um, if I could design, let's say I have a bridge and the roadway width is something like 34 feet. I'm making that up, you know, two 12-foot lanes, two 5-foot shoulders, what have you. I could probably get away with designing that bridge with four beams or with five beams. If I use five beams, the beams are going to be spaced closer together. I propose that using four beams is more economical. The beams will be bigger but there's one less girder to fabricate. That's one less a series of plates that needs to be cut, uh, a whole bunch of welds that don't need to be performed, less girders, that all means fewer cross frames, fewer bearings, fewer connection plates, maybe a little heavier, but in the end it's cheaper, okay, because it's less fabrication, okay. Make sense? Some rules of thumb, oh, give me one sec, some rules of thumb, uh, if you've got a span length less than 140 feet, you're going to use a girder spacing probably somewhere 10 foot to 11 feet. Um, uh, spans larger than that, it's probably going to get a little higher. But keep in mind, though, the wider the girder spacing, the thicker the deck. So, this is something to keep in mind. Yes, sir. Okay. Again, these initial size. Look, Let's look at it like this. This is just, uh, it goes back to fundamental assumptions in concrete or uh, concrete or steel. What load must all beams be able to withstand? Self-weight. Self now, at the beginning of, the, of a design problem, do you know what the self-weight is? No, because you, you don't have the beam, right? So what do you do? You assume a weight. Does it matter what that assumption is? Why? Because you're going to go back and check it, right? This is just an initial guess. It doesn't matter because you're going to do the math. You see what I mean? That doesn't, again, it, let's be clear. I mean, I'm giving you started you know, type, uh, type of size. It's in no way, shape, or form going to be your final answer. You're going to tweak it, guaranteed. That makes sense? Everybody else okay with that? Right. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, I already said that. So. Okay, um, <clears throat> some more key ideas, some plate thicknesses. Here are some general minimums to go off of. So if you're using stiffeners or connection plates, generally 7 16 is considered the minimum and a half inch is preferred. Half inch is preferred is because it's more readily available. 7 16 is a little bit more of a rarer uh, thickness than a half inch. You can find half inch plate any day of the week and twice on Sunday. Seven sixteenths, that's going to be a little tougher to find. The reason for the seven sixteenths inch minimum though is you start getting thinner. We're talking about steel that's going to be outdoors. What do you think is the problem if you've got really thin plates? Loss from erosion. So you got to have some, some uh, bulk there. So seven sixteenths is your minimum. Webs of your girders are usually selected in sixteenth of an inch increments in terms of thickness. Flanges usually go up in eighth of an inch. I mean, and the reason why is, is you know, webs, because they comprise so much of the weight, you know, if you increase the thickness of a web by an eighth of an inch, it has a much bigger impact on the weight than if you increase the, the flange. So the, flange, the webs usually go in sixteenth of an inch increments. The flanges usually go in eighth of an inch increments. We usually keep the flange thickness uh, at least at a minimum of three quarters of an inch. Never go below that. Um, <coughs> plate availability. Um, I recommend that you all go online and try and find some uh, documents from the Ashto NSBA collaborations. They have some really neat guides on plate availability. You know, if you're specking out a girder, um, and and uh, you know, let's say you're specking out a girder and you're using three-quarter inch plate. Well, three-quarter inch plate, if you're purchasing it, comes in you know, specific lengths or widths. Like, for instance, if I'm buying a, a piece of three-quarter inch plate, its maximum length is going to be 1,035 inches. What's 1,035 inches in feet? Take that and divide it by 12. Okay. 
you're buying three quarter inch plate from the mills, uh, its maximum length is about 86 feet. Your bridge is longer than that, which means splicing. Either a lid splice in the shop or maybe a field splice, like a bolted splice. So it's a 120 foot bridge, there's really no way around that. That's just a fabrication sample. You just can't buy plate that long. So just something to keep in mind. Plates, when you, when you buy structural plate, they come in standard sizes. It's like when you buy lumber, you know, two by fours, two by six. It comes in standard widths. So they basically roll it out of the mill in like 72 inch wide or 84 inch wide or 96 inch wide. Based on that width and that thickness, these are the typical maximum lengths that you'll find. So you'll, you'll want to pay attention to this when you're detailing your from a fabrication standpoint. Flange sizing. This is a big one. Never ever, ever change the flange width along the girder, okay? You've got a 120-foot bridge that you're designing. You do not need to use the same flange size across the, uh, across the span. Um, and in many cases, it's going to make sense to use a smaller flange, particularly at the supports. Remember, the webs support the shear, the flanges, the flanges support the moment, right? Think about a moment diagram. Where's the moment's largest? In the middle. And there's hardly anything at the supports. So if you can save some weight, and you're going to have to splice some stuff anyways, make your flanges smaller at the supports. However, don't, don't make your flanges make them wide. Okay? Let's say you make your flange wider you're going to have a top flange that looks like this. Right? Make sense? What are you going to attach to that top flange? Maybe the formwork for the deck? So now you've got formworks that are framing into this that are all going to be ha have to be trimmed at a different width. Make sense? Okay. Now, that's one reason. Here's another reason. This is something that you might not have thought of from a fabrication standpoint. Okay. Now, let's say, let's, let's fabricate the girders the way that I'm telling you to fabricate the girders, which is changing the thickness. Okay. Let me show you what happens. Okay, watch this. And, and the easiest way to show you this is to just like pull up a, like a smart notebook. Okay, so flanges come in, or plates come in standard widths, right? So let's say I've got some 72 inch plates. So what I'm going to do is I'll have, you know, one plate like this, right? I'll have a thicker plate in the middle. And then I'll have you know, another plate here. So from a fabrication standpoint, this is all I need to do. I need to weld here, you know, weld those plates together, and then cut, 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 and then there's my flanges. Okay. Now think about this from just from being in the fabrication shop. I mean, have you ever been inside a fabrication shop and seen, like, uh, have you ever been to like Huntington Steel or any place like that? I mean, these plates are huge. They take a lot of effort and time to move them and manipulate them from one place to another. Okay. Y'all ever seen these before? I mean, pick up a large structural plate. I mean, it's pretty flimsy. It can be a a, um, uh, a fair amount of work. To perform these welds, what you end up having to do is you have to start off by, first off, you have to do a bunch of surface prep. You have to weld off what are called these, or weld these little runoff tabs. So what they're going to do is they're going to weld from end to end. So you have to have a little piece of steel at the very beginning to catch the rest of that uh, metal. Then they grind these off uh, and cut. But if you change the width, here's what you got to do. If you change the width, you have to take you know, this plate here, this plate here, and then now you're going to have a wider plate. Okay. So the first thing that you got to do 
is you've got to cut them into strips. You've got to cut them into strips, cut them into strips, you know, cut them into strips. Then you have to maneuver each one of those little strips together. You have to put one little strip right here, one little strip right here, you know, one little strip right here. You have to weld some more runoff tabs, weld some more runoff tabs, weld, weld, and then you got to cut a little bit of that excess off here and here, and then you've got to do that, you know, four or five times, however many girders that you're fabricating. I propose to you that if all you do is change the thickness, you can do one set of welds, one set of cuts, and your flanges are done. So never ever change the flange width, change the flange thickness. Makes sense. No, I'm saying for all your girders, change, if, if you're wanting to optimize your girder by changing some sizes, change them by changing the thickness, not the width. Within the beam. So I'm talk, that's what I'm talking about, within the beam, within a single beam. What do, you, what do you mean attach beams together? I don't understand what you mean. I'm trying to understand the, the example. Are you saying that there was an abutment, two abutments were 150 foot apart, yeah. and they had a single beam that was 150 foot length, but they spliced beams together, and you're saying like the centerpiece had a wider width? No, like they, um, they had to use three or four beams to meet the length. One what do you mean three or four beams to meet the length? I don't understand what that means. Like it's 150 foot long. Are you saying one beam went 20 feet, another beam went? Yeah. And you're saying from beam to beam the flanges got wider? Yeah, like two or three of the beams were wider than the other. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm just, let me, let me make sure, because I want to. It changes as the splice. Yeah, it changes as the splices. The flange got wider. Yeah. Were they rolled shapes? Mm, I don't think so. I think they were rolled. That was a wrong decision. That was bad. I mean, it was, it ultimately cost them more money from a fabrication standpoint, and when they were casting the deck, it made it more difficult to install the formwork. Am I wrong? Or were you? Well, see, I can just take my pick and just put wrenches in it. Everything's 150. Do, do you see what I'm, so, so what I'm getting at, so you're saying that like they had a beam like this, you know, oh God, here comes isometrics. Okay, and then there was another beam that they spliced to it, but it had a wider flange. And so they splice those together. So if I was looking up top, you'd have a flange like this, and then you'd have a flange like this, and then they would bolt them together. That, that was bad. They shouldn't have done that. Because now you've got different formwork of different, of different lengths. That makes it more difficult there. Plus from a fabrication, now the welding issue gets taken out because they're not welding them together. But... Um, just from a formwork standpoint, that just made it probably a little more complicated. Now, I haven't gone into the numbers, so maybe the numbers dictated that in the end, dealing with the formwork issue was ultimately going to be less expensive than just making the flange thicker. But it seems to me that if the flanges were the same width, then all the formwork pieces would be the same length, and it would all be regular installation. I would not have done that. I know you didn't do it. That I'm not trying to. I'm not calling anybody out or saying that there's. I don't know all the facts, but I'm saying, in that specific, with that example, with that information, I probably would have made the flanges thicker as opposed to wider. That's just me. Because all you have to do is this from a splice standpoint. You've got a flint. You got a, an I beam here, right? You've got a thicker I beam here, right? Just splice, splice, filler plate, filler plate. 
pretty simple, actually. So, yeah. What's up? I didn't like indirect. What? No, go ahead. Wait till the recording stops. <laughs> My, my, yeah, I, I apologize if my drawings are that bad. But yeah, uh, in general, I think it's a better idea to make the flanges um, thicker than it is um, uh, wider. You can also have some advantages for like, for instance, if you're um, dealing with something like a skewed bridge or if you have bridges or elements that are of different span lengths, it makes it easier if you've welded these together to fit in, you know, all your cuts into a single plate. It ultimately reduces what uh, ha has the potential to reduce waste as well. Helps you out when you're ordering steel. You're only ordering the steel you need. No. <laughs> no timber. Are you going to tell me some more scary stories that I don't want to hear? <laughs> Hydraulics. Who cares about that? <laughs> Who cares about H and H stuff? <laughs> so, um, oh, oh, that's that sad. It's five hundred. I have seen bridges though that are straight like string deck. You talking about like a grid deck? No, I'm sure they're there. I'm saying we're not using them. I, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of grid decks from corrosion and from freezing and all. No. No. Ponding. Yeah, no ponding. No ponding. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, uh, no grid deck. Typical, you know, reinforced concrete deck. Why are you such a fan of grid decks? <laughs> wooden decks or wooden beams? <laughs> Take a chainsaw, just let the log fall, asphalt on top of it. <laughs> Stop signs and no, the, uh, the road road. Oh, okay. <laughs> they put those I was thinking about the posts, yeah. Threw them to the posts and then uh they kind of filled it with asphalt. Then the road on one side is just a bunch of road signs with the asphalt cut through them. And you know as soon as they did that somebody just said, it'll hold. <laughs> 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 All right, that you know what? Look, that 
that should at least get you started from a sizing of a girder standpoint. I'll start walking you through some calculations next time. Um, I do recommend that you all begin to research DOH standards and details because I didn't cover concrete solutions because they're there, right? It's all there. So um, that's where your own independent research needs to come in. That's all I got. Uh, I'm excited to hear some stories off recording, uh, the, these bridges that, that you wanted to, to wait on. So, all right, we'll see you.